introduce uh, founder and CEO of GoFly, uh, Gwen Leiter, and uh, then we'll jump over to Dave to get started. Thank you, Nidhi, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. As you all know, GoFly's grand sponsor is Boeing. And in addition to Boeing, we are joined by a number of different corporate sponsors and in-kind sponsors. And as well, we are supported by over 20 different international aerospace and STEM organizations to bring you both the prize and all of our programming with GoFly. So today we are very pleased to be able to welcome Dave Neely to give today's master lecture. Dave is the chief engineer for Boeing Next Cargo's air vehicle program. And Dave has been with Boeing for over 14 years. Prior to serving as the chief engineer of that program, he was the senior manager in Phantom Works for the integration of advanced operations and quality. And he was the IPT manager for the 777X rudder and elevators prior to that. David also served as the F-15 IPT wing manager supporting new development, production, flight test, fatigue test, and fleet sustainment. Dave was the TLE for the external MRB support team prior to moving into management. He has also served as an F-15 Singapore plane captain subsystem support in F-15 center install, an MRB engineer and structural analyst. He has a BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Missouri Rala and an MBA from Washington University. And without further ado, we are so pleased today to welcome Dave Neely for today's master lecture. Thank you uh, again for having me. This is uh, really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start by showing kind of a, a grand vision video of what's in everybody's head about where do they think uh, disruptive mobility is going and this whole marketplace and then talk about how do you prioritize safety to allow for rapid development and learning. So w with that, we'll, we'll start, uh, start rolling the video. The world is changing. By 2030, the global middle class will by half reaching over 1 billion households. Two-thirds of the population will live in cities. Technology is advancing, yet current infrastructure and systems limit the potential that can be unlocked. Explosion of e-commerce and their expectations of frequent, fast delivery increase pressure on mobility networks. As change accelerates, it can slow us down. Commutes get longer. The cost of mobility infrastructure skyrockets even as we run out of space to build. Most U.S. air traffic flows through a handful of airports, and a mere 1% of cargo travels by air. These challenges offer the opportunity to envision a new, seamless way of connecting goods and people. We're at a convergence point. We have the technologies and enablers to support autonomous, on-demand mobility at our fingertips. Boeing experts are prototyping vehicles to explore and validate these technologies. We're investing in ecosystem development with partners of all sizes from all industries. Advances in connectivity, analytics, AI, machine learning, and propulsion will help us shape the future of seamless on-demand mobility when, where, and at the scale needed. This new world of travel and transport is more than the next generation of vehicles. The surrounding ecosystem will enable this radical change in mobility, connecting goods and people around the world, preserving safety, creating much needed convenience and efficiency. It won't all happen at once. Integration of new vehicles and systems will evolve from small autonomous air vehicles to larger purpose-built aircraft. This evolution will reshape mobility to meet the needs of a growing on-demand economy all made possible by a safe and reliable next generation air traffic management system, allowing piloted and autonomous air vehicles to coexist safely, innovative propulsion systems to improve economics, reduce emissions, and access both densely and sparsely populated areas safely. Digital infrastructure supported by machine learning and data analytics to optimize operations design and execution. A software and technology suite that helps create safe, seamless mobility while protecting the security of people and information. Integration with existing transportation networks, unlocking the potential of underutilized infrastructure. 
Boeing has a legacy of building the future, driven by a passion for taking humanity further. We have a track record of tackling challenges with the safest, most reliable solutions, changing how goods are moved and people connect around the world. We've created a network of satellites and revolutionized global communication systems. We've created vast, secure information networks with millions of users, nodes, and advanced data analytics. We pioneered commercial aircraft, the transition to the jet, and the supporting ecosystem that forever changed the world. And we continue to innovate with more efficient airplanes. For decades, we've tested the boundaries of autonomous technologies from seabed to space. Boeing has made the unimaginable a reality for more than 100 years. And we haven't done it alone. We'll continue to work with other industry leaders and new and existing partners to create a vision, an ecosystem for the next generation of mobility systems to be imagined, designed, developed, and delivered. We're identifying new business models to fundamentally change the way we approach the market. We're supporting and investing in new technologies and incubating new businesses we know are critical to support this future vision, a future that's better for society and the environment. Join us on our journey. All right, so that is a, a really cool vision on what do we want things to be? Where do we think we're going? But from an engineering standpoint, it's also incredibly overwhelming. So there's so many different parts and pieces and things that have to happen. If you look at, you know, getting integrated into the airspace, uh, building platforms that are ready to work at all the autonomous levels, working in vehicle to vehicle communication. So, so from an engineering standpoint, you can just get absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, and you don't even know where to start. And that's one of the, the keys that that we've kind of taken is really to focus in on what are some key learnings? What are those high nails, those, those big rocks that are in your way that are a part or a start to making that vision a reality? So in outlining those key things and focusing on only those key things and not trying to solve everything at once um, is what really allows that. So, We'll talk a little bit about and we'll show what we did in the, the first round of the development of the cargo air vehicle. Uh, but to set the stage for that, you know, we really focused on a few key things. We wanted to know more about electric propulsion and where we thought it could head, uh, specifically around batteries and motors. So where, where are those? What's the benchmark for the industry? Uh, how is that technology progressing? What are the good things about it? What are the bad things about it? And and focusing on that along with the scale. So some of this stuff doesn't really present a problem until you get to the right scale, until you get to the right size. So when you see this video and you look at what we did in the first round, it was really focused on understanding those few key things and not worrying about focusing on or, or working on anything else that had to do, like you'll see it's a very simple, um, erector set type structure. We didn't want to learn about building good structures. We, we know how to do that, uh, but we didn't want to spend a whole lot of time, energy, and effort on doing that until we understood the rest of the system. Um, so I'll go ahead and launch into that with that in mind. I saw it take off, I was inspired by it. This team of Boeing engineers was able to do the impossible and deliver a prototype. In a matter of three months, we took a concept from a piece of paper all the way to a flying vehicle. So this is an octocopter, it's fully electric, on some Boeing custom designed batteries. The goal is to grow into a uh, large strip of cargo platforms. If you extend the range and extend the payload a little bit, when you think about delivering 250 to 500 pounds over a 10 or 20 mile radius, you can change the way that the world connects, you can change the way that we deliver goods. We've really got a convergence of technologies right now in terms of hybrid electric propulsion vertical takeoff and landing and autonomy that is going to unlock air travel in areas that we haven't seen it before. So it becomes a test bed for future businesses such as maybe an electrically vertical takeoff cargo. This is my dream job. 
of trying to come up with something new that the industry doesn't have yet. So it's exciting. The company really is trying to change the future of the world. They are driving and on the leading edge and pushing the envelope, but doing it in a smart way. Boeing is at the cutting edge of technology in aerospace. We have a chance here to really change air travel, and we'll look back on this day as a first step in that journey. All right, so um, some of the things to highlight, and, and really when, when we talk about what was the key to this rapid development or this uh, quick learning, and, and it, it was and absolutely is safety. So some of the things to point out, if you look at in the top left corner of the screen, uh, there, there's ballistic shielding that's, that's lining and surrounding our engineering team. Uh, the reason being that you, you look at all the different things, so you, you build the matrix of what could go wrong? What are the possible scenarios of, uh, you know, things that could happen as we develop and learn? And our goal, uh, everybody's goal always is to, to go home safe, right? To go home to our families, uh, to make sure we don't get hurt. So we spent a lot of time really going through and developing a matrix of likelihood of risk, likelihood of issues happening, and then the consequence of a lot of those issues happening. So. You know, with a, a lot of these multi-copter type systems, when you have a short squatty landing gear and a heavy platform, you're, you're really worried about blade strike, uh, blades hitting the ground. And so with that scenario, we wanted to make sure that nobody would get hurt. We understood it was, it was possible. It wasn't, uh, you know, necessarily highly likely, but it was a very possible scenario. So we set up an operation that would allow us to go get the learning and get the learning quickly uh, but have uh, zero risk to the team in terms of injuries. And, and that's one of the key things that I think is, is really neat about what's going on in the world and how things are changing. You're starting to see technology become affordable and miniaturized, that it fits on these aviation-style platforms uh, that allow us to now go and integrate it and get in a position where the platform and the safety of the people are not intertwined. If you look at most of the products, uh, typical aviation over the last hundred years, uh, there's people inside of the vehicle. So the functionality and operation of the vehicle is absolutely tied to safety. Uh, but these new systems, these new technologies are allowing us to go and develop and learn and learn in an area where not, not that it's our goal or not that it's highly likely that we lose the system, but if we do lose the system and get our key learnings, it's still a win as long as everybody on the team really went home, you know, safe. Nobody got hurt. Maybe, maybe we lost the platform. Maybe we did some damage to the platform that we can update or fix. But that is a, a real key enabler to allowing this rapid learning and rapid development that's going on. And uh, I think some of the things when you, when you focus on what, what really needs to happen or how do you learn it, it's, it's again, zeroing in on those key learnings. So what do you want to learn? And just as importantly, what do you want to not learn about? And taking that mentality and driving the team through all of the trade studies, through everything you're looking at, through everything you're doing, uh, one, are we, are we learning the key learnings that we want to do? And what we want to get from this, so you know, in our case, again, electric propulsion, batteries, motors, are we getting that out of the system that we're designing? And then let's not spend a whole lot of time building the, you know, the world's greatest landing gear or some very, you know, phenomenal looking mole line that uh, looks really cool, but took a whole bunch of time, energy and resources and didn't get us what we needed. And then the, the next piece as you do that, um, really start thinking about the high level design and how does that design feed your concept of operations. So chewing through what are you going to do operationally uh, and even taking it down to a day to day level. When the team comes in every morning, you know, when you start it, how are you going to build it? And when you're building it, how do you build it so that it's safe? How do you make sure that you're not handling heavy parts, that you don't have a lot of pinch points on the vehicle, uh, that you don't have areas with, you know, there, there's a lot of power on this system. So making sure that 
electrically you're safe, you're grounded, you're shielded, um, everything's terminated appropriately. How are you going to go through those checks? How are you going to do that to make sure that even if it's a finger pinch, a cut, you know, a sprain back, none of that should happen. Uh, so, so taking that through the concept and helping that inform what your design needs to look like. And then the next level is that'll come from that. Once you get the idea of the concept, it's going through, how are you going to operate it on a daily basis? So what's your daily cadence? And based on how all that's going on, you know, what, what happens every single day, what do you need to do operationally to make sure that everybody's safe? You can see we got a lot of wires on the floor, taping all the wires down, making sure there's no trip hazards around the vehicle. We talked a little bit about the ballistic shields and the safety glass. So working with your team and then really valuable bringing in other independent resources and independent assessors that can look at what you're doing and decide, does that really make sense? Is that really the right thing to do for you and the team? Um, and, and how do you develop this con op to enable those key learnings to happen, but again, do it without anybody getting hurt. So, you know, some of the things we did, we bought in the Boeing to fire department and they took a look at what we were doing and how we were doing things and helped us assess the risk. They helped us assess the safety needs. And uh, just as importantly, we also had identified a, a safety leader on the team. That safety leader had full authority to uh, step in and question designs. They also could send the, home, the team home if they thought we were tired or if things were getting a little pushed or a little uh, unsafe in, in the hurry and drive to go get what we're doing. So having that independent look or that independent assessment uh, is, is really important and getting it from multiple different levels across the entire uh, concept of operations and daily cadence is, is really important. We had folks from flight ops and flight safety that are used to operating either rotorcraft systems or man systems to come in and look at what do they think we should be doing? What do they think we, we shouldn't be doing? Um, walking through and then taking that information again. And if you think about this spiral, so it's key learnings, kind of high level design, concept of operations, that'll flow back into the key learning. And that is all surrounded and encompassed by making sure the team is safe. The, the one thing that would stop us from going fast and stop us from getting the learning that we wanted was if somebody got hurt. So we knew that that could not and would not be the case. Uh, and, and again, it's getting as many different sets of eyes on it and really thinking through what are the worst case things that could, could happen that day based on what you're going to do and how you're going to test and, and what can you put in place to mitigate them. Uh, you, you can see in the picture we had uh, a, a really heavy steel plate that held the vehicle down when we were doing ground run-ups to make sure that it didn't get away, to make sure that we didn't have an issue where uh, if we got more thrust than expected, we, we would have a problem. So we designed and developed uh, tethers and safety shields and safety plates uh, ground support equipment that would come in and allow for easy maintenance on the vehicle where you don't have to worry about prop strikes. So spending a lot of time on design and development of processes, tools, and procedures that go around and support this vehicle and support the ecosystem were, were just as important as developing the vehicle to enable those key learnings. Uh, so some of the steps and how do you figure out what to focus on, what's really important, um, what's the T, you know, what, what do we need to do as you go through design and development, coming up with as many of what we call the building blocks or, or basis of test to anchor your analysis, to anchor your uh, analytics to is extremely important. So, even if it's as little as, hey, we tested the battery at the cell level because we wanted to understand at least what that would do, what the limitations are, what the concerns are, and what the risks are there, and then have something as we extrapolate into the, to the bigger and more powerful batteries that's, that's really important. Uh, in this case, this is some of the testing that we did in the wind tunnel, and, and even if you can't get in the wind tunnel, doing 
uh, thrust test setup. So can you run the motor? Can you run the motor on a dyno? Can you understand the performance characteristics of the motor? Can you get some data to anchor into what is that going to do to your overall system? Understanding your propellers, the expected loads on the propellers, the loads that the, vehicle, that the propellers are going to put into the vehicle is really important. Those all go around how do you do it? How do you do it fast? And how do you do it safely? So if you go through your entire buildup of the vehicle from cradle to grave and look at every single piece and component in there and say, what can I do to get as much information as I can as early as possible? And how do I make that information that we've gotten as similar or as representative of the flight aircraft as possible? So that's the test as you learn philosophy that we or test as you fly. So how do you learn and test the same way that you're going to fly so you don't have any hiccups or um, unexpected learnings or, or maybe even false positives that are in there is really, really important. Going, you can even go into how are you doing, um, you know, your cabling, your wiring, what sort of tests can you do with avionics, what can you do with software. In the first round, we spent a lot of time with a surrogate vehicle, so flying a, a small um, drone assembly with uh, similar software and similar avionics suites so that we could really learn where the, the chance of failure is maybe a little bit higher, but the consequence is minimal uh, to nothing. Again, that, that system was still operated behind either safety netting or safety shielding, uh, but it allows you to understand how your, how your systems are feeding into your, your vehicle management system and how things are responding and what sort of flight control characteristics are you getting out of it and you're doing it in a really safe way and you're doing it early enough to inform the design and inform the learning. It's uh, incredibly important. And, and then you can even take it into, you know, with those key learnings and those key enablers, we talked a little bit about, you know, the structure of the vehicle, but what's your margin policy? So how are you going to design and size your parts to, to make sure that they'll enable the key learnings, but also not drive you into a spot where everything's so heavy, it's never going to fly. Uh, but, but thinking through the risk levels, the different materials systems that you're using. Uh, so, you know, whether you use uh, some new untested material system, if that's something you want to learn about, if that's your key learning, um, focus on that and build a system around it. For our case, it wasn't. So we wanted to use really standard material sets, things that we're very, very comfortable with that we have allowables for. Um, you know, standard carbon matrix and aluminum tubing that we, we really know, uh, know and trust uh, the, the numbers that come out of it and the calculations that we can have. And then taking a, a good approach and again, getting those independent assessments and reviews of here's what we think the right, you know, margin is for static loads. Here's what we think the right margin is for fatigue loads. Here's how we're going to assemble. Here's where we have redundancy in the vehicle. And here's where we don't. And I think that's a, a big key to building that safety matrix is, is going through the system and understanding the risk points and the risk posture of all those points and then the likelihood of them. So, so where do you have single string failures? Where, where can you have uh, high expectations of events that, that would cause uh, catastrophic um, you know, a catastrophic wreck or, or something like that. And then how do you mitigate against it or test to reduce that risk? So for a lot of our single point systems, we tested them out beforehand and then you can go and take those systems and have assurance that they're ready to go. And you can build an operation around it where you say, we're never going to go power on if we have any kind of issue with the system or any kind of tr trouble and what monitoring needs to be in place to make sure that when the test conductor says this system's ready to go and you go full power on, you have assurance that all of your critical systems are working. And at any point in time, if you have an issue with those, what's your procedure to say, hey, I have a problem. How do we stop the test and how do we stop the test in a safe manner or as quickly as possible to try to minimize and mitigate those risks? And drilling those into the team every single day so when you come in, you should have a safety brief. You should talk about where you're going, what you're doing, why you're doing it, 
and what happens and all the different possible scenarios um, if anything does come up. And, in, and then you go into your test procedures and what are we doing? How are we testing? Defining what we really want to learn that day. Again, what's important to us? What are we trying to get out of this test? And how do we do it safely? What are our knockoff criteria? What are the things that we're watching? Who's responsible for those? And everybody that's responsible for those has full authority to raise their hand, call timeout, or stop the test. So everything that we're doing is driven around getting that key learning. And after we get that key learning, making sure every one of us gets in the car and goes home safe and, and can be with our families. So, it, and then it's an all, it's always a spiral. So one of the things to make sure that you have a really open mind all the way through this, because as these key learnings roll in from whether it's a wind tunnel test, a motor test, a battery test, you're going to get data, you're going to get learning, and that's going to change or shape the path that you're running. And you need to make sure that you are absolutely able to make those adjustments. You have an open mind, and you're, you're ready to accept the learning, accept what you saw, and then make the adjustment to, to really drive that next step and work in on that spiral to get the platform to where you need it to be to get the key learnings. Um, it, it's another thing we didn't talk about, but um, you know, as, as you get into um, the product, the product safety, losing the product, losing the platform, that can be, if you have an unmanned system and if you have a safe operation around it, that's okay. So that needs to be something that's tradable. You have to have things that are tradable and you have to have things that you can, um, you know, things that aren't. And for us, safety wasn't tradable. The key learnings were, were not tradable and everything else around it was tradable. So we needed to have uh, flexibility on what were the limitations of the vehicle, what were the limitations of operations, uh, working towards what are your limitations around design cycles and schedules and um, so working through some of that and, and again even you know where do you spend your money, what what do you focus on and, and cost and, and being able to trade and make some adjustments there um, where needed to allow the key learning and allow the safety but maybe not what you do in the long term as you get more and more mature to develop the product. Uh, so here's a, a kind of picture and a, a vision of where we're heading and, and what we want to do. And, and I'd say the, the biggest key to a lot of this is developing the culture of the team that everyone is okay raising their hand saying there's a problem, everyone needs to be okay, um, calling time out and stepping back. And then it's really valuing the inputs of every single person and valuing each other so that you're constantly watching out for the safety of the team, the safety of everybody on the team and what you're doing to test is, is absolutely critical. And if you genuinely care for each other and you've developed that culture where it's fun it's exciting, um, but it's also ex very comfortable and, and we know we can raise our hand and, and say, hey, I've got a serious problem or I need something uh, you know, to, to go look at. You, it'll be taken seriously, it'll be respected, and it'll be thought through. And as much process and procedure and rigor as you can put around it, it it's extremely important and then you add on that the, the most important piece or ingredient to that process, procedure, and rigor is your team culture. It is your trust in one another. Uh, you have to have those folks watching your back, looking out for the big picture, um, looking out for what you're trying to, to accomplish. What are those key learnings? How are you going to enable those key learnings? And how are you going to do it? so that you don't have to compromise safety, so that you don't have to compromise um, those key learnings in your test setup, uh, in your building blocks as you walk through this. So all that is uh, very, very important. Um, 
and and what you trade on and when you trade on it and how you trade on it again is something that uh, we like to watch very very closely so I think I, I did want to leave I know we got a, a little bit of extra time but um, I have some some more stuff I can go into but I want to make sure we get to a lot of questions so Nitty, I don't know if we want to start rolling into those and then we can kind of extrapolate and expand as we as we dive through some more of the details. Sure. Um, so thanks, Dave, so much for that really informative presentation. Um, folks, uh, as usual, remember that you can post questions via the chat that we have on the webinar, as well as using the Q&A button that's appearing at the bottom of your um, panel. So please feel free to submit questions there and we'll be sure and share them with Dave. Um, so one of the questions Dave, that we've got is, um, is there a safety checklist that we should be using? Um, can we find one somewhere? Um, and how do we uh, work with something like that? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say, I guess there's a, a couple of levels to that. Um, and we have some contacts that I can get you in touch with. Um, but I would, I would say it starts with, what we call a risk matrix and that risk matrix is going to go into all the likelihoods and probabilities uh, that of, of events, what could go on. And then from that risk matrix, you're going to go and develop a safety checklist that talks through and walks through each one of those hazards, how that hazard is mitigated, whether it's operationally or from a design standpoint. Uh, and then you'll go through that checklist every single day and it'll be loaded into each of the test cards. Um, so, so kind of, I think that's something that, that if the teams are, are looking for help with, we'd be more than happy to have uh, some of our experts kind of help shepherd along the way. Uh, uh, how do you do that? And, and how do you have that rigor and process around it to make sure that you've spent the right amount of time really thinking about all the different things that could happen how they could happen, why they could happen, when they could happen, and then what did you do to mitigate it? So it's that, that risk-based approach. Um, again, a lot of it, if you can do it operationally, that's a, sometimes a lot easier than trying to do it through the design. Um, it can enable a lot of those rapid learnings and, and key developments, but um, getting that, that whole thread that, that kind of ends in your safety checklist and your test cards is incredibly important. And so following up on that, um, you know, you would spoken about obviously including all of your team members, making sure that everyone has the space to be able to speak up um, and in sort of having regular meetings discussing uh, your planning and what you're up to. Um, do you have the safety meetings every morning? Um, how often should they happen? When should you be discussing um, these issues? Yeah, so um, it, it's a, we do, if, when we get into operational tests and we're actually going, uh, you know, into power on or we're building up the vehicle, we'll, we'll do a safety brief every morning. Uh, we'll also do a safety brief at the end of the day. So, so we'll talk through when we start the day, the first thing we do is here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Here's when it's going to happen. Here's how it's going to happen. And here's all the things that we need to be concerned about, the risks, the hazards, the mitigations, and from a safety standpoint. In addition to that, we'll take a full roster of everybody on the team, who's there, making sure that we've got accountability. So right before we go power on, we can go through the checklist and make sure everybody's seated where they're supposed to. There's nobody else that's around that's not supposed to be around. Um, and again, finishing up the day with how did we do? What were the issues? What did we find? What could we do better? What do we need to change for tomorrow uh, to enable it? And uh, I, I think driving that again at the bookends of the day at a minimum is when you should do it. And then if there ever is anything that is a close call or didn't go to plan, that's when you do a safety stand down and you really call timeout and you pull everybody in together and go, why did, why did, why did we have something that was close to happening? Even if it wasn't an in incident, um, how did it get that close and what are we going to do about it? to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So it, keeping it in the forefront of everybody's mind every single day is, is really important. Um, and even getting it to the point where it, it doesn't feel completely routine um, 
so you can change up the kind of what you do in your briefing every day, but really making sure everybody's present, accounted for, and understands everything that we're trying to do, when and where they need to be, and and knowing that that uh, you have folks with full full authority where if there's people that aren't cooperating or aren't listening, they'll get sent home, right? So it's just non-negotiable across the board. And if we can't designate a person um, to be a safety role only, um, how should we pick someone on the team to be a safety point person? Um, I think it's, it's finding somebody that's got the willingness and the, the right attitude. It's a little bit of a different, different mindset when you try to approach these things operationally and allowing saying, hey, there, there could be something that happens to the hardware, but as long as it doesn't happen to the people or the process, that's, that's the kind of folks that you want to look for that have that, that flexibility to say, okay, I understand there's a problem or there's a risk or there's a concern. Um, with this concern, what are the 10 or 20 or 30 different things that we could do to minimize or eliminate that concern? And, and so somebody that has that kind of flexibility and open-mindedness, but uh, also is, I would say, very methodical and process oriented where they're not going to uh, kind of fly by the seat of their pants or, or just uh, make a lot of off the cuff type decisions. You really want to take time. You want to think through these. You want to be methodical about them. And then again, giving them that full authority to, to be able to, to call time out or to raise questions. And, and I think that's where whoever is leading the team and guiding the team, understanding the difference in personalities where, uh, you know, some people may not talk up or speak up in, in large meetings or large groups. So you, you got to do some of the, what conversations need to happen behind closed doors? How do you, you know, how, and then what needs to happen in front of the team and, and how do you make sure you're providing all the different forums to get that real time feedback, positive and negative from everybody that's there every single day. Mm -hmm. So Great. finding that personality, that mindset, and that capability is really what you want to look for. Okay. Great. Um, next question is, how do we get prepared in case you lose control and communication with the UAV during flight tests? Yeah, so there's uh, multiple steps that you can take, and I think you need to work through all the different scenarios. So, um, you know, if you look at operationally, the, the first level that you want to set up is where you're flying and how you're flying. You want to make sure that from a ballistic trajectory standpoint, you're not going to get near any hazards. So you set your team up in a position where everything's happening away from the team, and then you want to be in a space or a location where if there is an event that uh, is an uncontrolled landing, your risk to personnel and property is, is minimized or completely eliminated. Um, that, that's kind of step one. And then two is really deciding and designing in your software and in your hardware, what redundancy do you have? How much, uh, how long can you live without comms? And, and then, you know, if you lose comms, what does the vehicle do? So, you know, do you go to early landings? Do you have places identified that, that are safe zones that, that you can go guide to? Um, working through those operational standpoints is, is really important to do. Um, and again, I would, I would say once the team has come up with, here's what we want to do, I would suggest getting multiple additional sets of eyes on that plan to really try to poke holes in it. Say, what if this happens or what if that happens? Um, how are you going to deal with that event? Um, and, and walking through that and then developing that concept of operation that, that allows for um, the safety of the team and, and at some point may have to compromise the safety of the vehicle. Great. Um, just a reminder, please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. Um, the next one we have, Dave, is are there any safety resources online um, we should look to? Um, anywhere we can look um, for safety books, articles, procedures, 
um, such that we can start planning our own safety requirements? That's a great question. Um, I am sure there are. I don't have any off the top of my head, but I will go. I'm taking a note right now. I will touch base with the team and we'll go ahead and get that information out and get it posted so that we can have those quick links and quick, quick references for all the folks. Um, next question is, uh, what kind of work do you do, do you need to perform with the FAA in order to certify this vehicle for commercial use? Um, so it's a great question. Uh, right now, uh, there, there is no um, good path for certification that's out there yet. They were working hand in hand with our government ops folks and our FAA counterparts to talk through what do we think the right way is and how do we go about uh, certifying these systems or what, what would that look like in the future? But that's still a, uh, a big thing to, to work. And again, as we kind of talked about compartmentalizing, what are the key learnings? Uh, from, from our side, we're really focusing on developing a system to allow for some of those key learnings to happen. And we have uh, uh, separate groups at the company that are really working on what, what do we need um, or what, what could certification and regulation look like in the future? Uh, so we're, we're not uh, necessarily driving any of that activity. We're, we're more just understanding and keeping our pulse on it and focusing on the, the technical learning that's happening. Um, okay, great. Any other questions from the attendees right now? Dave, it looks like that's the, the questions we have so far. Um, of course, everyone has an opportunity to be able to send in questions um, and uh, we'll post the video, obviously as we have done with all of our other lectures uh, this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to pass it back over to Gwen so that she can share some more details about what's upcoming. So thank you, Dave, very much. That was an incredibly informative and insightful and necessary master lecture. So thank you for your sage advice and your expertise there. Um, as a, a follow-up, um, GoFly will be posting uh, the new safety resources that, that David Neely mentioned. Uh, as soon as we receive them, we'll post them uh, most likely as updates. They may also go on the document section of the website, so we will get that information to you. Uh, and so too, uh, in follow-up to the question regarding uh, the FAA, uh, in terms of uh, FAA work with our GoFly teams, uh, the FAA will be designating a point person to answer all GoFly team questions. And you will learn who that person is in our master lecture with Earl Lawrence. I believe that is on, on October 5th, uh, but we will certainly be posting that for all of you. Uh, and uh, you can learn how to coordinate with the FAA and with whom specifically to coordinate within the FAA at that master lecture. So many, many thanks today for uh, a truly informative master lecture from David Neely. We appreciate everything uh, that you have said in your advice and expertise. We welcome you all to our next master lectures and, and wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.